We will now study five search algorithms, starting with breadth first search, UCS, depth first search, and then greedy base first search and A star search. What's interesting about all of these search algorithms are they are basically extension of the graph search algorithm that we studied earlier. They are extension of the graph search algorithm. The core idea behind all search algorithms is the same graph search algorithm. The only place where they differ is how you choose a leaf node and remove it from the frontier. You may have a different data structure to maintain your frontier. Basically, the core difference between all of these search algorithms is how you pick a leaf node from the frontier. Let's start with the first category of search algorithms, that is uninformed search algorithms. These are also known as blind search algorithms. The strategies have no additional information about the states beyond what's provided in the problem. In other words, it's just like saying, say for example, if somebody is flying an airplane and one of the engine is lost, and if the airplane uh, pilot is trying to look for an engine, he has no idea where to search for. The engine could be anywhere. So these search algorithms, what they do is they generate successors, that is all possible outputs, and distinguish a goal state from a non-goal state. So you just look at all the possible successors and then check if this is a goal state or not, check another one, check another one, and check almost everything. All search strategies are distinguished by the order in which the um, nodes are expanded. So um, all the uninformed search strategies may try, say for example, something like this is spiral. Say for example, you have something lost in, the, in a room like this and you want to find it. One approach that you may take is uh, look for things in this spiral way. Um, another approach that you may take is to start from this corner, go to this corner, again look for this area and then go back up and, and continue. Another approach, maybe you try this and almost sort of form a grid by searching. So you can apply different techniques in which you can explore all possible states and check whether they are goal state or not. Now strategies that know whether one non-goal state is more promising than the other are called informed search strategies or heuristic search strategies. Those are different. We'll cover them later, but for now let's look into um, uninformed search strategies. We'll start with the breadth first search algorithm. BFS is a simple strategy in which the root node is expanded first, whatever is given the initial state. Then all successors of the root node are expanded next. Here, for example, if this is our um, root node, we expand this first. And then we expand all of its successors and so on. In general, all nodes are expanded at a given depth in the search tree before any nodes at the next level are expanded. In other words, if this is my search tree, that is, from this node A, my possible actions are either I can go to B or C. Then from B, let's say the possible actions are D or C. So when I visit A, I have the choice of either going to B or C. Let's say I choose B. After I choose B, I have the choice of either going back to A and visiting C or I can visit D and E. In the BFS algorithm, we always visit, finish visiting all the nodes at a given level and then go to next level. In other words, now after finishing checking whether B is a goal state or not, next we go to C and we do not go to D and E. Only after we have finished all the nodes in this level, we go to the next level. Only after finish checking all the nodes in this level, we go to the next level and so on. And that is the reason why it's called breadth first search because we look at the breadth first and then only we go to the depth. And this is achieved very simply by using a FIFO queue for the frontier. In other words, the frontier data structure that you have, if we simply maintain a FIFO queue, FIFO queue, and place the unvisited nodes or new nodes into the into the FIFO queue, the graph search algorithm automatically serves as a base breadth first search algorithm. So here's the algorithm, and um, the only thing that's different um, about BFS from the graph search algorithm that when you initialize or create a frontier, you create a FIFO queue. 
And then when you remove an element from the queue, you pop the element from the frontier. And then you add this node to the explode set and um, everything else follows. Now, once we apply BFS to a graph like this, we can obtain BFS trees. So a BFS tree may look something like this. So say we start with the node A, the possible actions I can take are going to B or C. And then after that, after expanding B, um, the possible actions I can take are D and E, but then we will go back to um, C and expand it. So we have expanded C. So these are possible actions. Now I'll expand all the nodes in this level and so on. If we were to apply BFS, say for example, for the Romania problem, this graph, we start from Arad. The possible actions we can take are going to um, G, S, or T. We will explore G first and put this into the frontier. And then we will explore C, uh, S, put this into the frontier. And then we will explore T, put this into the frontier. And then we will explore these nodes, one, two, three, four, one by one after that, and then the nodes after that. That is in the next level, we'll explore this node, and this node, and this node. And also this node, because this is the next node after this node. Although BFS is pretty simple and straightforward, you can do a lot of things with BFS. In previous classes, when I've taught this course and other similar courses, one of the students did a really interesting project applying BFS. This game called Mesa Throne was developed by one of my students, Richard. Let's try to play uh, a normal one, it's quite difficult. So after me playing this game, the implementation of BFS found out that there's, uh, there was another shortest path with only 24 tiles, and I can ask it to show me uh, the, the other shortest path. He has also developed a feature where you can ask the algorithm to show how the algorithm runs. As BFS runs, we can check how it's exploring all possible child nodes and then reaching the goal state. Here's the link to the Mesotron game that um, Richard developed. Now let's look at the space and time complexity of the BFS algorithm. Let's imagine that we are searching a uniform tree where every state has B successors. That is, um, if this is our root node, we have B successors in the second node. For each of these nodes, we have again B successors and so on. The root of the search tree generates B nodes at the first level. Um, one, da, 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 B nodes. Each of which generate B more nodes for a total of B squared at the second level. So in the first level, we have B nodes. In the second level, we have... Um, b times b b square nodes each of these generated b more nodes yielding b cube nodes at the third level and so on now suppose that the solution is at depth d so let's say the actual solution is somewhere at depth d in the worst case it is the last node generated at that level then the total number of nodes generated is b plus b squared plus b cubed plus b to the power d. Here b is the number of successors at each, at each node and d is the depth of the tree where we assume that the solution is at this depth. Then when we sum all of these time that is needed, effectively this becomes a big O of b to the power d because all these numbers are relatively very small compared to b to the power d. There will also be big O of b to the power d minus 1 nodes in the explode set and b to the power d nodes in the frontier each time. So the space complexity is big O of b to the power d. So say for example, I am at the last level. That means at that time the frontier will have b to the power d um, number of nodes. That means even if I didn't keep any, everything else on my memory, I would need to keep b to the power d nodes in the worst case in my memory. So the space complexity is big O of b to the power d. The exponential complexity bound, such as big O to the power d, is scary. That's too bad. Let's look at some examples. 
Say for example, we have a tree with a branching factor of 10. That is, at every node you generate 10 nodes, from every node you generate 10 more nodes and so on. Then at depth 2, you will have 110 nodes. That's because we have 10 nodes in the first depth. In the second depth, we have 100 nodes. That means um, 10 plus 100, ignoring the root, will give us 110 nodes. Let's say the time that's needed to process these nodes is 0 0.11 millisecond, and the memory that's needed is 107 kilobytes. This is assuming that uh, let's say the CPU can process 1 million nodes per second and 1000 bytes per node. You will see that as soon as we reach, say for example, depth 12, then we have 10 to the power 12 nodes and the time that it takes to process all of these nodes is 13 days and the memory requirement is 1 petabyte. So this may, makes BFS very unpractical for many problems where uh, we have um, uh, branching factor as large numbers like 10 and we need to find the solution at um, depths like uh, more than 10 or 12. Sometimes memory requirements are a bigger problem than execution time because um, usually it's very unlikely to have a um, storage of one petabyte. However, time is still a major factor because if your depth is at solution, let's say 16, then um, given our assumptions that we have, it will take almost um, 350 years to reach for a solution. So then the question becomes, how did we, for example, successfully implement, how did Richard successfully implement the major train game? That's because here we are assuming that the branching factor is 10 at every point, whereas in Richard's case, because of many obstacles, the branching factor is not always 10. It's sometimes either only 1 or 2 or 3, and many nodes are visited because it's a grid. So that's why the time complexity reduces, reduces by a large margin compared to what we see in this table. When all step costs are equal, in other words, when the cost between going from one node to the other node is fixed, let's say for example, the cost of going from Earth to Zerin was one, other to CPU was one, other to Misura was one. So if this graph was connected with one cost between every node, then BFS is optimal. It gives you always the best solution because it expands the shallowest unexpanded node. That is, it looks for the closest node to its uh, beginning node. However, in real world, not many problems have the cost between the nodes as one. So for that reason, BFS is not ideal for um, many problems in real world. The next algorithm that we're going to look at is uniform cost search. So instead of expanding the shallowest node, what UCS does is expands the node N with the lowest path cost. This is the key for this algorithm. That is expanding the node with the lowest path cost, usually represented using GN. So here N is your node, and G gives you the path cost given this node. So this is done by storing the frontier as a priority queue ordered by this function g. That is uh, the cost associated or the priority associated with each node is given by this um, function g. So UCS does not care about the number of steps a path has, but only about their total cost. Let's see how the algorithm works for the Romania problem. Say we start at this city Arad. Then the path cost associated with the possible children are Zerind 75, Sibiu 140, and Timisora 118. Since by definition we are looking for a node with lowest path cost, in other words, higher priority is um, a lower path cost, we'll automatically choose to go to Zerind because it has the lowest path cost. Then next, our possible candidates. So after visiting Jerin, we look at possible children. So then we will add Oradia into our frontier as well. So far in the frontier, we have Timisora 118, Sibiu 140. And then now we will add Oradia. The path cost of going to Oradia is 75 plus 71 
that is 146. So now this is also added to the front here. So we have three nodes in the front here. One, two, three. Now the algorithm has to choose a node with lowest path cost, that is highest priority. So out of these, the node with lowest path cost is Timisora. So the algorithm will try to go to this, take this path of going to Timisora from Arad, and then look for its children. So then it will add this node L into the frontier with a path cost of 111 plus 118 which is um, 229. So now the frontier has 1, 2, and 3, these three items, with path costs of one, uh, 229, 140, and 146. Out of these, the node with lowest path cost is uh, CBU, so the algorithm will um, expand CBU and add its children to the frontier. That is, we will add Fergus with cost of 99 plus 140 and Reminis with cost of 80 plus 140 into the frontier. And this is how the algorithm proceeds. Here's a video animation that shows how the UCS algorithm works. We start with the root node. The cost of root node is zero. Let's say the root node has three possible children with path costs of 3, 8, and 4. Minimum path cost is 3, highest prior to this one. Chooses to expand this. After that, let's say this has 3, 2 children, each with cost 2 and 4. The minimum total cost of all the reef nodes is this one with 4. So then there are 2 nodes now with minimum cost, one with a cost of 5, other with also cost of 5. Tries to expand this one. There are no children, so it will expand this one. So now the minimum cost node with is uh, this node 6. So it expands 6, finds the goal state, here's path 1, it continues to expand other nodes, the next node is the node with priority 7, it expands this, there are no leaf nodes, it expands the next one in the, in the frontier, expands 10, so the path cost with um, going to th through this node is cost 10, so far the best node had 13, now we have found another node with 11 plus 1 is 12, so this should update to uh, lower path cost to 12. Now let's trace the uniform cost search algorithm as we apply to this graph. Our starting node is node S and our goal node is node G. And all the nodes have the costs associated as shown. We start with the current node, starting node as the initial state of the problem with the path cost of zero. And then we create a frontier as a priority queue ordered by path cost with node as the only element. So we have frontier F. Let's say here's our frontier. It's currently, it was empty, but then we added the first node to it. So S zero is in the frontier. And then we also create another set E as explored set, which is at the beginning empty. We look and we check if the frontier is empty or not. Currently, frontier has S0, so we don't return failure. Instead, we pop the node. That is, we remove S0 from the frontier, and currently, S is the node that comes out. We check if S is a goal state or not. It's not. So then we add S to explore. Then we have an explore set S. Next, we print the contents of the priority queue. So currently, frontier is empty, it has nothing. So in the first round, our frontier becomes empty. Next, we look at all possible actions that we can take at this node, which is S. The possible actions we can take are either going to node A with the path cost of one, or node G with the path cost of 12. Let's start with the first action. So say we take out child A, we check if the child is in Explorer Frontier or not. Since A is neither in Frontier nor in Explorer, we add it to the Frontier with the cost associated with it. So in our Frontier, we add A1 because the cost of going to node A is 1. So then we repeat this for the next child, which is G. Since G is also not neither in Frontier nor in Explorer set, we add G to our Frontier with a cost of 12. 
Next, we go back to the main loop. We check if Frontier is empty or not. Frontier is not empty. Then we pop a node from the Frontier. So since in the Frontier we have A1 and G12, A1 has higher priority because 1 is lower than 12. That means we pop this node A1 from the Frontier and we put A as our node. We check if A is a goal node or not. It's not. So then we add a node to explore. So then we add A to our explore set. Then next we print the contents of the priority queue. So now the priority queue in the second step has G12 as its element. Then we look at the possible actions that we can take at this node A. The possible actions that we have available are B and C. So if we go to B, the cost associated with B is 3 plus 1, 4. And if we go to C, the cost associated with this is 2. So then we add each of these child to the frontier. So this we have B4 and C2. Next, we go back to the main loop. We check if the frontier is empty or not. It's not. So then we pop a node from the frontier. So then since C has the minimum cost here or highest priority, we remove C from the frontier and the node that we are processing now is C. We check see if C is a goal node or not. It's not. So then we add it to the explored set. So we add C to the explored set. And then after that, we print the contents of the priority queue again. So priority queue now has in the third step B4 and G12. Then we look at the possible actions that we can take at this node C. So C has two children, D and G. D has a cost of three, 1 plus 1 plus 1, 3. And G has a cost of 2 plus 1 plus 1, 4. So let's say we look at the fourth child. Is child in Explorer Frontier? D is not in Explorer Frontier. So we add D to the priority queue with a cost of 3. Next, we check is the next child is G. Is G in Frontier or Explorer? It is. So G is already in Frontier. So we don't insert it to Frontier. Instead, we check is the child in the Frontier with a higher path cost. In other words, our current path cost is a cost of 4. Is 12 higher than 4? Yes. So then we replace in the Frontier with the new child. That means we replace G12 with the new child G4. Then we go back to the main loop. Check if the frontier is empty or not. It's not. So then we pop the node with highest priority. In this case, the node with highest priority is D3. So we pop D3. So the current node that we have that we are processing is D. We check if D is a goal node or not. It's not. So then we add a node to the explored set. So we add a D to the explored set. Then we print the contents of the priority queue. So the priority queue currently has B4 and G4. Now for each possible action in D, there is only one possible action in D that is going from D to G. Then the cost of going from D to G is the cost of going up to D is 3, 3 plus 3 is 6. We check if the child is in Explorer Frontier. G is already in Explorer Frontier, so we don't do this. Next we check if in the Frontier the child has a higher path cost. In other words, is a G4 higher than G6? It's not, so we don't do this. Then we go back to main loop and check if the frontier is empty. Then we pop a node from the frontier. Since B4 and G4 have equal priority, either of them could be popped. Let's say we pop out G4. So then our priority queue doesn't have G. And we check if the problem, if, if this node G is a goal state or not. It is. Then we return a solution. So then nothing is printed after this, and this is what you have in the priority queue. Instead, if B4 was popped out and G4 remained in the priority queue, then what would happen is we have node B as the node that came out, and we check if B is the goal state or not. It's not. And then we add B to the explored set. Then we print the contents of the priority queue. So then it would continue to print in 5, G4 as the priority queue. And the algorithm will 
continue. It is also very important to understand that the contents of the priority queue that we see in the screen, screen is very much dependent on where we have the print statement. Instead of having the print statement over here, if we had it right after the for loop, if we had it here, then the first output of the priority queue content would not be empty. Because when we first print the priority queue, it will already have S0 as the input. So instead of empty set, it will print S0. So where we have this print statement in our loop creates a big difference in what, what the contents of the priority queue printed on the screen. The next algorithm that we will look is depth first search. DFS always expands the deepest node in the current frontier of the search tree. The search proceeds immediately to the deepest level of a search tree where the nodes have no successor. So you start from the, this node. Let's say the possible accents are B and C. You choose this accent and after B you try to expand B, choose another accent and then again you expand D to look for possible accents. And then since there are no more children of H, you go back to D and then look for its possible accents, explore I, then you go back and, and repeat this process. As the nodes are expanded, they are dropped from the frontier. So then the search backs up to the next deepest node that is still unexplored. So if it has finished exploring a particular node, then it goes back up, leaves all of the nodes because they are explored, and then also looks for another deeper set of nodes from that particular node that's unexplored. While BFS uses the FIFO queue, DFS uses the LIFO, LIFO queue, that is the stack. This was a regular standard queue, whereas this will be a LIFO queue, which is actually a stack. Here's the general graph search algorithm that we saw earlier. What change can we make to this algorithm to make it DFS? As we discussed earlier, the only difference between various algorithms, search algorithms, is how they choose an, a LIFO node and they remove it from the frontier. In case of DFS, all that we need to do is instead of saying we have a frontier, we say that we have a stack. And instead of saying we choose a leaf node and remove it from the frontier, we simply say pop from the stack. Pop from stack. And also expand the chosen node and add the resulting node to the frontier. This will be stack. So this makes the algorithm um, death for search. When we are searching in a tree, that is not in a graph with cycles, but searching in a tree, death for search has advantages over BFS. In case of tree search, DFS needs to store only a single path from the root node to a leaf node, along with the remaining unexpanding sibling nodes for each node on the path. So say, for example, we have a tree like this, then DFS only needs to maintain storage for these nodes and not the entire tree. And once the exploration of the part of the tree is complete, DFS can remove them from the memory to save more memory. So then we don't have rest of the tree in memory. We also don't have what's explored in the memory, but only what we are currently working on. So once a node has been expanded, it can be removed from the memory as soon as all of its descendants have been fully explored. Because of this, DFS is adopted as the basic workhorse um, in many areas of AI, including constraint satisfaction problems and other places.